Exactly 50 years ago this fall, a very special building opened over on Quincy Street in Cambridge, just outside Harvard Yard, in between the Harvard Faculty Club and the Bush, Reisinger, and Fogg Museums, two very traditional buildings. But anyone who's walked by can see that this was uh, something very different. Uh, it's a fine use of concrete, the sweeping ramps, the uh, series of windows gently curving, shaped like a nautilus shell, the interplay of indoor and outdoor space. This was uh, modern architecture. And the man who created it uh, was this man, uh, Le Corbusier. Uh, he was arguably the father of modern architecture. He was a, a swaggering, dapper kind of guy, as you can see. And I've begun a, kind of a personal journey uh, researching him and his life and uh, uh, attempting to write a, uh, a narrative biography uh, of him and how he traveled the world on some of the earliest jet planes in dirigibles and on ocean liners. I like to think of him as the Steve Jobs of his day, trying to change the world through design. He was uh, an innovator, and I think there are some lessons to be had from the way that he broke free from the past and uh, took some new perspectives on architecture and how we live in cities. Now, he was born uh, Charles Edouard Generet, and he changed his name to the moniker Le Corbusier. It was a Paris in the 20s, avant-garde kind of thing. Um, it may seem a little pretentious, but it, not that uh, different from some other rock stars who have rebranded themselves. Think Prince or Sting. Uh, he uh, grew up in Switzerland and then became a French citizen. Uh, most people in this country may not uh, have heard of him. They may have heard of another star architect, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, who of course designed the Guggenheim. And Frank Lloyd Wright built many more buildings in this country. The Carpenter Center was the only building that Le Corbusier, Le Corbusier built uh, in North America. Frank Lloyd Wright built many more. In fact, if Le Corbusier was Steve Jobs, then Frank Lloyd Wright was Bill Gates. They were peers and competitors and uh, they were uh, all, both on the cutting edge of architecture and urban design and urban planning. Now, when Le Corbusier started out in Paris in the 20s with his own atelier, he was really uh, setting out to revolutionize architecture. And he did so with uh, this building, Villa Savoise, just outside of Paris, uh, and uh, as you can see, it's the architectural version of an iPhone. I, I promise not to extend this metaphor much further. Uh, but uh, the clean lines, the indoor and outdoor space, the light in the air, uh, he was looking at homes as what he called a machine for living in. And uh, this was uh, his new approach to uh, marry the technolo technological advances and industrial advances of the day. When he was asked to build an, uh, a, a chapel uh, not far from his home, hometown in Switzerland, in eastern France, he came up with this, Ranchamp. Not so much a cathedral, but an experience. Another masterpiece, La Tourette, the convent just outside Lyon. And uh, the Ministry of Education in Rio de Janeiro. Here you can see some similarities to the United Nations building in New York, and indeed, Le Corbusier is really responsible for the design of the UN building in New York, but he was kicked off the design team because he was a bit of a pain in the neck and, and, and uh, a bit of a drama queen. Uh, but here you can see the glimmers of the United Nations building. And then also Chandigarh, uh, an entire city that Le Corbusier built from scratch uh, in the Punjab state in India. He was uh, a furniture designer, a painter, a friend of Picasso. Um, he even designed a car that arguably is a precursor to the Volkswagen Beetle, maybe even to the Prius or the Mini. Um, and he was an interior designer 
Uh, many of the things that he created, one can see in the IKEA catalog today. Uh, perhaps uh, something that he is better known for, uh, and not in a good way, are his ideas about urban planning. But I want to unpack this a little bit. Uh, this is his proposal for the city for three million people uh, in Paris. Uh, it required bulldozing a large swath of Paris north of the Seine. Now, I know what you're thinking. This is not really that great an idea. Now, it didn't happen here, uh, most would say, thankfully, but it did happen uh, here in this country with the Model 4 Towers in the Park. This is Washington Square Southeast, just south of Washington Square in New York City. Uh, but you see it in Charles River Park right here in Boston and uh, dozens and dozens of, dozens of public housing uh, projects uh, across the country. Uh, this uh, interpretation of Le Corbusier's ideas were executed in such a way that uh, it left us with some ill-advised public spaces, such as City Hall Plaza and the Government Center redevelopment um, and the uh, era of urban renewal, highways through cities, um, slum clearance, uh, and all of the uh, negative associations that we have uh, today for that time. Well, so there was a backlash against these ideas, and it was led by this woman, Jane Jacobs. She was a housewife from Scranton. She was very proud to be called that. Uh, she was very proud not to have any credentials and was a self-trained urban expert who wrote a book called The Death and Life of Great American Cities. She moved to New York City in the 1930s and had trouble finding a job, so she didn't have anything to do one day, put a nickel in the subway, and got out at a station called Christopher Street. Fell in love with Greenwich Village, made it her neighborhood, and really the model neighborhood, in her view, for the best urban environment. Mixed use, uh, access to transit, uh, buildings of only four to five stories high, uh, front porches, eyes on the street, lots of activity, the sidewalk ballet, as she put it. Uh, in a place like Greenwich Village. But then, uh, let's bring it back up to today. What Le Corbusier was trying to anticipate was uh, an enormous growth in the urban population. And this is indeed what we're facing today. Uh, the planet has over seven billion people right now. Now, over half of that seven billion currently lives in cities. Uh, this is primarily in the developing world. People are flocking to cities, uh, predominantly poor people, very poor people from rural areas in search of a better life. And uh, this growth is occurring uh, overwhelmingly in uh, sub-Saharan Africa and Asia. And here's the frightening part. Uh, they're finding substandard housing, uh, an estimated one billion People live in slums or favelas or shanty towns uh, without uh, decent housing or access to uh, sanitation or uh, clean water. And so, if you take a look at uh, the uh, the cities, uh, the most populous, uh, 20 most populous cities today, you see some pretty big numbers, uh, and um, uh, th there are. Uh, uh, 32 million people in Tokyo, uh, places like uh, Manila and Beijing and Karachi, not that far behind. Uh, but that's just today. If you look to 2025, which is uh, the year that the best projections are available, uh, we see a lot bigger numbers. Uh, Tokyo up towards 40 million, others in the, in the 30 million range. And you'll notice there are some cities here who were that, that we're a little less familiar with. Uh, these are those cities in the developing world that are going to be taking in these many millions of people. And these are places that don't really have a very strong rule of law. Uh, they are places where there's already a lot of informal settlement or slums. And so they really are crying out uh, for planning to figure out how to accommodate these many millions. Sally Angel, a New York University professor and visiting fellow at the Lincoln Institute, 
has done some extensive research on this urban expansion and recommended that uh, cities need to make minimal preparations uh, to make sure that there is decent housing for all these millions of people moving into cities. He recommends that we should have ample urban land for that housing uh, and to plan now for parks and open space and for the infrastructure and for the grid that's going to be required. And cities like uh, New York and Barcelona in the 1800s went through this exercise. They saw that they were going to have many more people moving in. And so in New York City, for example, there was a commission that set out a grid. Most of the settlement in New York City at the time was in lower Manhattan. And uh, the commission uh, figured out that they needed a grid to go all the way up to 96th Street and beyond. They uh, anticipated the population growth and planned for it. And this was what Le Corbusier essentially was attempting to do. This is uh, Unité d'Habitation in Marseille. It's part of a concept that he called the Ville Radieuse. Um, and uh, he uh, was looking at how to bring about greater density uh, and uh, sort of have people live in, in urban environments with uh, super efficient, slightly smaller uh, living areas. So Unité d'Habitation had these uh, many apartments as well as the world's first supermarket right there in the building uh, and a gym and a school um, and recreation areas on the on the roof. Uh, the smaller living areas were indeed uh, super efficient. Um, this is a room from La Tourette, but it's the same idea. It's a bit like if anyone has ever stayed at the Hudson in New York City. Uh, it's a similar concept. Uh, and by the way, a part of Unité d'Habitation has been turned into a hotel. And the manager told me that couples looking to stay in the smallest rooms, uh, she asked the question, are you in love? <laughs> But it's, it's, it's a matter of some rapidly changing demographics. Uh, we're no longer uh, uh, a nation or a world of, of uh, Ozzie and Harriet, two kids, two dogs, I had two kids and a, and, and a dog. Uh, rather, there are um, many more singles uh, and many more renters. And for this changing demographic, uh, there, the, the living space needs uh, are, are, are much different. You're seeing uh, this kind of design go on uh, now with the uh, uh, Danish uh, architect uh, Bjark uh, Ingels. This is the Eight House, which is really a contemporary version, I would argue, of Unité d'Habitation. And the uh, New York City initiative for smaller apartments is aimed at accommodating uh, two million households that are just one or two person households. And, uh, could use a lot more efficiency. And uh, right now what you're seeing is uh, doubling and tripling up in the existing housing stock in New York City. There are some uh, funky designs to uh, come up with more efficient use of space and emphasize density, such as this uh, fanciful proposal for a parking lot in New York City. And of course, uh, Japan has been on the forefront of uh, looking at smaller, super-efficient housing and, more, and greater density. There's an added bonus here, which is that all of this ends up with a smaller carbon footprint and uh, a, a more sustainable urban future uh, is part and parcel of uh, these different kinds of housing designs. Now, this is all in the context of a lot of very challenging work that our designers and architects and urban planners are facing. Um, it's all on a much larger scale, on a, on a more regional scale. Uh, it has to do with infrastructure and planning for the impacts of climate change uh, and uh, looking at a post-carbon uh, future with uh, transit and high-speed rail and other uh, transportation infrastructure to serve these growing cities. So make no little plans, the Chicago planner uh, Daniel Burnham famously said. Now Jane Jacobs uh, 
kind of mocked that, that phrase. I think she thought that it was kind of a male-driven, male-ego-driven kind of thing, and she, she may have had a point, but uh, it's important to remember the human scale of neighborhoods, but cities, I think, do need to make big plans, and uh, they need to plan now for this more efficient housing, for, for greater density, uh, and can learn a lot, I think, from Le Corbusier and the way that uh, he innovated and looked at things with a new perspective uh, and, and uh, was, was creative. He designed buildings on the back of envelopes and on cocktail napkins, uh, and he wasn't afraid uh, to take a radical break from the past. So it's become fashionable uh, over the last 50 years or so to to ask WWJS uh, alongside what would Jesus say, what would Jane say? Uh, and uh, th this relates to, the, to, to her ideas about the, the human-scaled neighborhood. But I think we should be careful not to be wedded to a new ideology if modernism became a kind of dogma all its own. Um, I think our times require this kind of innovation and creativity and imagination. Here's Le, Le Corbusier on his beloved beach in uh, the south of France, having some fun looking at uh, different, perspective, different per perspectives on his hands. Uh, and our times and this exploding urban population, I think, uh, requires that kind of imagination. Whether it's the apartment building in Marseille or the fine use of concrete at the Carpenter Center uh, that uh, looks like it's uh, taut like a full sail. So I'd like to leave you, leave you today with the idea that instead we might ask, what would Le Corbusier say? Thank you very much. <laughs>